Hi there, uh, my name is Mike Gonzalez uh, with Green Vigilante Media. Today, um, we are here with Aiden Hill, who is a candidate for City Council District 7 in Berkeley. Aiden, uh, thank you for being here with us. It's a pleasure. Excellent. Um, I've been looking forward to this interview. Um, the first thing I do want to start off with is I discovered you in a video where you talked about being the first uh, legally non-binary candidate. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, so California, as well as New York, and a few other states have started to implement this gender marker X uh, for all those who do not identify as 100% male or female. And in California, with the Gender Recognition Act, uh, I thought it was going to be a great opportunity for this next year. So the gender marker X's roll out uh, January 1st. That means IDs, birth certificates, data identification papers, all can have these new gender marker X's. And so as someone who is openly non-binary, uh, meaning I'm trans, intersex, gender queer, uh, I would like to be the first legally non-binary public office holder if elected to this position. And uh, that will start January 1st. And so the importance of that is that as soon as I'm elected as a legally non-binary public office holder, if I cross a state line, then I can provide the tools for a gender marker X to be released at the circuit level and then at the Supreme Court. And so it's really exciting. That's excellent. That's great news. Hey. Um... So another thing that's very exciting about you as a candidate is that you're very young. Um, you're a student there uh, at Berkeley, correct? Yes. And what are you studying? Political science and then oh. uh, public policy. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So that gives you a good base uh, for, for being a representative in our government. But you also already have some experience. You... Um, represented us in the United Nations. Um, can you tell us what kind of work you did there? Yeah, so I was a youth representative. I worked primarily with the National Model United Nations, and we partnered with the UN to uh, discuss policy uh, with various student organizations from around the world. And so my goal mostly was to understand the diplomats' perspective, meeting with diplomats, uh, UNDP, uh, the development program, uh, UNHCR, uh, the Human Rights Committee, and then discuss how states implement these policies and what the next generation of leaders are going to do as a result. And so I've met various diplomats from around the world and discussed these policy measures, including environmental reform, resource efficiency, cybersecurity in the digital age, and then discussing those same policies with students uh, who are a part of this program and then implementing them at the local level. And so, yeah, it was really exciting. Um, being at the UN definitely gave me an international perspective towards these issues. Um, and then we got, got to realize, well, if all of these same countries are having similar problems, how do we best solve them at the local level? And so I was going to work at the UN, actually. That was my entire goal until I realized that if I didn't solve it at the local level first, then the same problems are going to replicate themselves. And so that's why I'm running for Berkeley City Council. Wow, that, that's impressive. Um, you're young and you seem so, uh, so not only accomplished, but to have a very uh, focused direction, it seems. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yes, that's great. Um, so uh, I noticed from your uh, Facebook page that one of your primary uh, issues is, is housing. Um, can you tell us about how you would solve uh, the housing problems uh, in, in Berkeley? I mean, uh, obviously, the housing problems are all over the U.S. and specifically in California. It's a very difficult issue because of the cost of living here, but can you tell us what you would do there in Berkeley? Yeah, so this district, uh, Berkeley City Council District Number 7, is unique in the sense that it has access to a public university, uh, the number one public university in our, in our world. And so one of the major problems with the housing crisis right now is the university under president of the UC Regents, which is a former Homeland Security officer, <laughs> uh, we are continuing to expand enrollment 
regardless of the minimum amount of properties. So last year, the university enrolled 9,000 students to the college, even though we're in a housing crisis. And so one of that is reforming public education as a whole across California. I don't believe that uh, a university degree is necessary or even practical for the majority of people. And so ensuring that people have access to community colleges, CSUs, as well as UCs. And then uh, at the city level, my goal is to ensure that there's a flow of tiny houses that people can legally camp out in their trailers and RVs uh, to make sure that we have access to cooperatives, uh, a, pu a strong public housing market where people can uh, encourage others to move in with them and get reduced uh, rates or payments from their properties and really trying to build local solutions, including uh, city sanctioned tents, camping materials, sleeping mats, um, and then that's going to offset cost of building full developed units uh, to help people survive in this city. And we have to do it at a regional level. And so I'm working with uh, mayoral candidate Kat Brooks for the tiny housing program specifically to make sure that people are off the streets. And so, or at least if not off the streets, then making sure that the streets are more welcoming to them. And so, yeah, that's, that's the whole plan with housing. Uh, but we have to really rethink what does development look like? Developing for whom? And then why are we developing as if we own this land when it's Ohlone territory, indig indigenous land, um, as a result? And so all those questions are coming up to the forefront. Excellent. And it's a great point that uh, we are on indigenous land. Um, you also have a plan for hunger. You say, it sounds like uh, you want to try to... Um, make sure nobody goes hungry and you have a plan for that. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so my biggest thing when I approached hunger was dealing with police criminalization. And so there really is this war on poverty, on homelessness. And uh, the police tend to criminalize those who don't have the nutrients to function in society. And so when I was in community college, I learned primarily about nutrition and then uh, I became vegan two years ago. And so what I understood was that one, the prices of food are way too high. Like I've, I've been in Target and I've seen uh, a loaf of bread be $7. And I'm oh, like, wow. okay, well, what does this mean? But uh, people don't have access to nutritious food anymore. Um, so I'm partnering with food pantries, including the UC Berkeley Food Pantry, uh, small uh, community-based organizations, including food cooperatives, and making sure that people have access to foods. Uh, so that includes food, not bombs in, in that. And the second thing is to gradually lower food prices overall. So I'm partnering with uh, Blockchain at UC Berkeley uh, to see how we can create this new monetary system that helps those who are living within the city reduce overall food prices. And so instead of $5 for a sandwich, I'm hoping we can reduce it to $2 using blockchain um, for Berkeley residents. And so that will offset prices as a result. But yes, uh, people are under, um, people have less nutrients than they need to function. And that results in criminality because people, because they don't have food, because they don't have basic needs met, they want to get it somewhere. They have to get it somehow to survive. And so it's this whole function of make, making sure people's basic needs are met, and then we can discuss uh, criminality as a result. Yeah. Excellent. Um, it sounds like you have some good ideas. Um, I guess along the, the, the lines of housing also is Prop 10. Um, how do you stand on Proposition 10? Uh, vote yes on Prop 10, repeal Costa-Hawkins, the rent is too damn high. and. Uh, Costa Hawkins, it might seem nice. Uh, I know that, especially in Southern California, people are afraid that uh, the property taxes are going to increase, which they will. The property taxes will increase because, and this is important, uh, when you have property taxes, those go into the local schools. Uh, they go into the infrastructure on city streets. And... Uh, Typically, it is low-income communities that cannot raise their property taxes because of Costa-Hawkins that we have this 
society where you don't even get sidewalks anymore. Schools are getting secondhand books. And so once that proposition is repealed, once communities have access to develop at, according to their needs, then we're going to see a surplus of benefits to the community. Um, and it, it sounds like, and I want to I want to make this easy to digest. When you raise property taxes 1% every year, which is what's currently happening in Costa Hawkins, that's great for rich societies because 1% could equal $1,000. But when you're in low income societies, 1% would be 10 cents, for example. And you can't do much with 10 cents per person when you're trying to rebuild your society from colonialism, from racism and uh, gentrification. And so you have to really think, how can the local community best apply this um, to make it better for themselves? Yes, it will put everything in a state of chaos because we're in a state of chaos already. <laughs> um, however, the intended result is to allow people to control their own, their own societies. And I think Prop 10 is a great start to that. Excellent. Um, you have another idea for Berkeley uh, along the same lines and uh, you're in favor of the People's Park. Can you yes. tell us about that? Power to the people. <laughs> um, so yes, People's Park was, uh, it's an interesting and a beautiful story actually. So People's Park was developed because the university had bulldozed uh, a series of houses on one of the streets. Uh, they illegally evicted a lot of residents because they owned those properties. And then they tore them down in order to make student housing. Now, what happened was they kept it as a vacant lot, uh, mud and dirt, and where people parked for about seven years. And then at some point, the students at the university just took a bunch of plows and uh, got grass and made it a beautiful park. Uh, the university had tried to put a fence around that park. And then uh, people from around the country, from Oregon, Colorado, came in to defend the land and to say this land belongs to the people. Uh, so much to the point that the university tried to resell the land for a dollar. <laughs> um, now, People's Park is under attack as it's reaching 50 years again. And uh, for the survivors of Bloody Thursday, that's when President Reagan came in with the National Guard and uh, actually murdered a few of our students um, who weren't even a part of the protest, but were just simply onlookers. And so what's happening right now is the university is trying to redevelop on that land and build it as student housing. And I just wanna remind you, student housing here in Berkeley is $1,200 for a triple bedroom, meaning you don't have any space anyways. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what I've found with the community is that it's a sanctuary really for people that need somewhere to go. And it's filled with mostly low income as well as people of color who use the land to find safety in a society that is criminalizing them. And so I'm 100% in favor of protecting People's Park. I believe that we need open space. Uh, People's Park is the only disaster relief area in District 7 right now, currently. That's open space. And that's so important when we deal with climate change in the future. Where are people going to go when they need help? Student housing? That's not going to happen. And so we need to protect Indigenous land uh, and make sure that everyone is included in that. But also People's Park is unique in the sense that it has survived for so long because of user development, those who are on top of the land, developing the land for their needs. And uh, so people at the park are creating classes, there's meditation classes happening, people are learning how to sell and trade and do all these beautiful things. And, uh, but we're still under attack from the university at large. And so uh, as a candidate for Berkeley City Council, um, who would be representative of that area, um, I'm saying 100%, you should not develop on People's Park. We have empty, uh, empty buildings that the university owns that they can build housing in if they so choose. But because the university doesn't own the land, they lost it after eminent domain. They're trying to get a get-rich-quick scheme by developing on the land.
but uh this land has been around for a long time and it's it's a land of resistance 50 years of resistance in berkeley and so uh i'm just trying everything i can to make sure that we protect the park <laughs> well that's great it sounds like a great meeting place for the community as well oh yeah beautiful, beautiful. excellent um Hey, tell us uh, if there are some unique uh, issues to the environment uh, for Berkeley and, and what how, what your position is on those. Ooh, unique issues to the environment. So Berkeley, I don't know if there's any unique issues. This seems to be oh. happening across the country. Um, uh -huh. But one thing that we're trying to implement now is the students of the university are tired of cars they're becoming a public safety hazard um so for example on telegraph avenue uh which is the main uh business district in the area sometimes at night you get people just like roaring their cars down the street you have bars right on that avenue um students crossing and then i actually know a few people who have been hit by cars in berkeley um as a result and so what the what the next generation of leaders are trying to do is create a strong public transit network. Um, we're utilizing uh, technology such as GIG, which is a car sharing program. Um, Lyft as well is being utilized and trying to get people away from their own self-owned cars to community-owned cars. And so uh, what we would essentially try to do if that happens is one thing I want to do specifically is repurpose plastic waste. So plastic is an insulator. And uh, I personally believe plastic is the new gold. <laughs> and so we can rebuild city streets with plastic. We can build tiny houses with plastics. And so that will stop uh, extreme temperature changes as well. And uh, through these programs, we can make sure that, one, we're reducing our carbon footprint. Um, by repurposing this waste, as well as making sure that we have safe streets and uh, safe in infrastructure too. And so I think that's, that's something that's unique to Berkeley only because we have a bunch of people that really <laughs> are dedicated to the environment out here, um, but we're also moving against um, a meat-based diet. And so the city of Berkeley has uh, declared uh, meatless Mondays uh, to promote uh, plant-based living. And so my thing is, why don't we uh, manufacture tofu and soy at extreme rates? And so we have those products available for all consumers. And then we can also uh, repurpose the way people create their foods with uh, seitan, tempeh, and all these different products that are plant-based. And uh, I'll just say the reason why is because uh, when we're looking at labor and workers, I personally believe we can't ignore the labor force and the workforce that is beneath human beings, those who give their bodies, their secretions, their children in order for other people to survive. And those are non-human animals. And so if we really want to build a society in which we're not using people for their labor, we have to start at the beginning. And um, currently, 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions are made by the animal agricultural field. And so that's an easy solution to get to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. And so those are some fundamental things we're trying to do here. It's really it's going to be a really good time, I believe, um, to see how we can move forward in a society. Um, and thankfully, we have a university to start implementing solutions across California as a whole. And so, yeah, I'm really excited. Oh, that's great. Um, that's an important issue. And, and it sounds like. Uh... Berkeley specifically is a good place to get those things uh, going uh, with the very progressive, uh, like you said, uh, college. Um, hey, let's talk about policing. Um, can you give us your views on policing and maybe what you might do or want to change there? Yeah. So fun fact, uh, Berkeley was the first place that modern policing began with August Wagner. Uh, August Wagner came from Berkeley and created the modern police force and then went to LA. Um, and LA actually didn't like him too much because he was more progressive than them, but they liked the idea of how to move into the police force. I've said publicly that uh, the modern police system is the direct descendant of the slave patrol system. Those who tell us when to go, where to go, what to do, how to act, 
Um, and so policing as a whole needs to be fundamentally refigured. So I'm in favor of non-police officers being first responders. So mental health units, uh, get rid of handcuffs, um, especially for those who are disabled, uh, making sure that people reduce the amount of surveillance that is around. And so right now, the police association in Berkeley is pushing for cameras being in public parks, um, specifically San Pablo. I'm saying that's a direct violation of our constitutional rights. And plus, cameras don't really help too much anyways. But uh, with policing as a whole, we really do need to stop criminalizing poverty. And so we need to make sure that there are other institutions in place other than police officers available. Um, and I also want to talk about like the people seem to forget, but this last year, we've had an increased amount of non people of color calling the police on black people. Um, and that's happened in Oakland, Richmond, uh, Nia Wilson, an 18 year old black woman died at uh, MacArthur Bart from a white supremacist who had just gotten out of school. Um, however, the police didn't react in uh, the police hadn't reacted yet. Um, they didn't react until there was enough time for the um, the suspect. Can, to can I ask you? Um, I, uh, on on my screen, it it looks like you broke up a little bit. Oh, can you oh no. can you start off uh, when you talked about uh, Miss Wilson? Yes. So uh, Nia Wilson was an eighteen year old black woman student who and her sister uh, were attacked by a white supremacist at MacArthur Bart in the middle of the night. Uh, the police had waited a, a number of hours before they released the image of the person who had murdered her. Um, Sean King, uh, an internet celebrity, had called for a public manhunt against this, against this person. However, the police didn't respond in a way that you would think um, the death of two women at night <laughs> would provide. They waited, they waited, they couldn't find him. And then the, the assailant felt safe enough, safe enough to get back on the BART system at Pleasanton before they were apprehended. And so what, what this shows is that the police agency as a whole does not care to the same degree as uh, mass murders or mass shootings as they would for individual black lives. And we really do need to discuss that, how we're gonna move forward. And so uh, I'm a staunch proponent of an independent police review commission. I believe the community should be able to um, give at least recommendations on how the police association moves forward. I don't think that should be uh, controversial. Um, and then as a result, I'm in favor of body cameras um, currently, Berkeley police has body cameras available, but they're not being implemented. Those are uh, easy, quick solution, as well as the police need to tell people that they're being recorded by body cameras. We need to really think what is cyber crime going to look forward, look towards in the future? What is in a police state surveillance is going to be a huge problem in the future. Um, and it's a huge problem right now. And so my job is to really have this dialogue between the community and the police association um, in order to create these changes that are going to be so pressing in the next few years, within one year, actually. And so my whole thing is we need to reform the police association. Um, I believe that there is a role for the police in our society as uh, shootings across high schools are occurring. We need people who are trained. We need people to remain safe and orderly. Um, but that doesn't mean when the lights are off and when the TVs are gone that police can abuse people um, because those are occurring as well. And so we need to make sure that we have a whole discussion that includes the community and the community feels elevated in their power um, in order to make the necessary changes as a result. Excellent. I'll tell you that here in San Jose, we had an independent police au auditor. Um, we still have that position, but the um, police unions is very strong and they're always um, going to put pressure against that and they actually forced our current auditor or our previous auditor to resign um, for various reasons. It's, it's, it's a tough fight, I'll tell you. Um, but I like your ideas. I also like your ideas on the community policing. I think that is certainly a, a way forward. Um, 
And so um, you also believe in a sanctuary city. Um, we're a sanctuary state, but you want to take it to a next level. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So Berkeley was one of the first sanctuary cities uh, within California. I'm very happy that California as a whole is a sanctuary state. Um, one unique thing about Berkeley is that we're actually an international state city because of the University of California Berkeley people from around the world are always going to be in this area so we have proposed solutions including changing welcome signs to say uh, uh, to encourage people to live and love life sanctuary city Ohlone territory um, but the next step for what a sanctuary city is one privacy privacy needs to be protected at all cost and two we need to make sure that there's actually no indication in which ICE can communicate with uh, judicial officials. And so one thing I wanna implement in Berkeley is creating new ID cards. Um, these ID cards will have a picture, a preferred name, and then a barcode. And within that barcode is all the information that uh, the police themselves would need from an individual. And so that would be their gender marker, that would be uh, a current address, but it wouldn't talk about whether someone is documented or undocumented. And so when we get this information, um, it's, re it's prohibiting the amount of people who would have access to it as a result. And so we want to make sure that people are protected in the city at all costs, um, because we don't have a city jail. People are sent to Santa Rita. Um, and so the problem right now is that regardless of whether the police agency works with ICE, ICE has an easy chance to uh, get information from our judicial system, partially because we don't encrypt any information. <laughs> and so we have to make sure that we're limiting the amount of information available from these ICE agencies and government as a whole in order to protect our civil population. Um, hopefully that makes sense, but it, it's all about reducing the amount of available information to make sure that people are protected and their privacy is protected as a result. Excellent. Um, sounds like uh, you have some good ideas. Um, uh, a lot of them I like regarding uh, policing. Um, so in Berkeley, you guys have uh, if, ranked choice voting. So if we wanted to vote for you, you're asking us to... Uh, put you ranked one. Can you talk about ranked choice voting and specifically what you're asking people to do? Yeah, so I want to preface this, that ranked choice voting isn't perfect. Um, people have to play the game still. I personally like approval voting, so you can vote for as many people as you want and the one who gets the most votes wins. Or you can have a ranked choice approval voting. <laughs> so for example, you can vote for, let's say there's two candidates on the ballot. Um, and you vote for both of them, but let's say three candidates on the ballot and you vote for all three, but only two have a significant portion. So to get more than 50% of the vote, then you can have uh, those two in a runoff election. And then that would be like ranked choice voting. But to explain ranked choice voting, it's giving you the opportunity to vote for as many people as you want. Um, and then the one who loses, the one who has the least amount of votes who the people that voted for that person ranked one, their second vote goes into play. And so uh, what it does is it gives a more equal, equal opportunity for the actual winner to, for, to win. And so with ranked choice voting, I'm saying vote Aiden Hill ranked number one, because that gives me the most weight to win an election. Let's say that I have a bunch of ranked number ones, but ranked number twos. If the person that an individual ranked number one loses, I would get that ranked number two vote. And that would help me uh, win an election. That's different from, let's say, the top two primaries where you can only rank, where, where you can only vote for one person. This is giving you more options. And so it's a, a step in the, it's a good step in the direction of democracy. However, we can do better. We can do approval voting and where you can vote as many times as you want. <laughs> um, but ranked choice voting is progressive, uh, beneficial in a sense that it gives people more options than just one person or the other person. And really to discuss the issues that are um, needed because 
no one should be deprived of the right to vote when we live in a society that's depriving so many people the right to vote. And so uh, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Excellent. And also it kind of eliminates the problem of the lesser of two evils. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's, that's the good thing about ranked choice voting. Um, well, thanks a lot, Aiden. I, now, I guess there's a very uh, interesting event coming up. Um, it's the um, Gr Green Power Rally with Jill Stein. Jill Stein was the uh, 2012 and 2016 presidential candidate for the Green Party. Um, you're going to be attending with Laura Wells, Saeed Karamuz, and Mike Murphy. Can you tell us about this Green Power Rally coming up on October 28th? Yes. So it's going to be hosted in Berkeley. Um, and then it's actually very interesting, the, the speakers that will be there. So, for example, Laura Wells was a write-in candidate, however, was one of the only write-in candidates to be and, and got on the ballot as a result against Barbara Lee. <laughs> and so it right. did something great for the Green Party in the sense that we're actually on the ballot. We have a Green Party candidate that people can vote for. And so we're going to discuss uh, how we're going to move forward, moving away from uh, a two-party system within California to include Greens on the ballot. Um, and so I'll be there to discuss a student perspective, a youth perspective. We have Saeed from Oakland, who is a marvelous candidate there, and Laura Wells, who is on the ballot uh, for the the uh, assembly as well. And so we're going to discuss, one, what does it mean to be green in 2018 when we have uh, Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court for a supposed lifetime appointment? Can we have a revolution? What is that going to look like? Um, and then who are these candidates? Who are these people that are fighting in favor of human decency, grassroots democracy, nonviolence, ecological wisdom and social justice as a baseline of what we're going to do next? And how can we emphasize these leaders and similar leaders further to make a quote unquote green wave and bring uh, environmentalism back to politics? And so it's gonna be a fantastic event. It really will be because we're gonna discuss how we as a society can move towards a more fundamental and climate prepared future because we don't have a planet B. We have to make planet A, Earth, uh, a fundamental focal point. And we're at the midst of a, I mean, the revolution is already happening. You can see it across, this, <laughs> across the world. Um, how do we uh, participate and make sure that the voice of the most marginalized are heard and protected? And then that's all gonna be discussed at this rally. And um, it's actually kind of funny, like Bernie Sanders is going to come to uh, the Bay Area to to um, to try to help Barbara Lee get elected. And we're like, well, why are you helping Barbara Lee? <laughs> but right. that means that means that they really see the Green Party as a threat because uh, the Democrats have declared themselves to be a private organization in 2018. So it doesn't matter what you vote for as a Democrat. They'll just change the the elected results as they have in the past. And so when you have an actual group that's focusing on democracy, it's a threat to the establishment as a whole. And so really come out if you want to be a part of the revolution um, and a part of the resistance, because uh, I believe Berkeley, Oakland, the Bay Area as a whole is going to be a focal point um, because of our historic past of resisting Black Panthers, the student movement, all of it is going to come up again. And we're going to discuss it there. So yeah, feel free to come by. <laughs> awesome. Let me uh, just go over the um, the time and date. It's uh, on Sunday, October 28th, uh, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at South Berkeley Senior Center. That's at 2939 Ellis Street in Berkeley, California. Um, and I'll put some details up on the video. But uh, yes, it sounds like a great event, and uh, I hope people will show up. Green candidates are showing up all over California these days. And in city council, we have three running for Congress, made it to the top two. Um, it's a very exciting time for green candidates in the progressive movement, for sure. Aiden, so um, if people wanted to uh, volunteer or contribute to your campaign, how do you have a website or how could they do that? 
Yeah, so uh, I've made it very easy. <laughs> uh, you can follow the campaign at Aiden, A-I-D-A-N, A as in Adam, uh, the number four Berkeley, and that's on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can message our campaign directly at m.me, so m as in Mary, dot me, slash Aiden for Berkeley. And then if you want to volunteer, uh, we actually have a Slack team um, and that you can help table, you can help uh, help with the infrastructure, meet and greet people, Canvas, and that is uh, bit, B-I-T dot L-Y, capital A, the number four, capital B, uh, capital V as in victory, volunteer. <laughs> and then uh, to join that campaign team or message us in any of the capacities, um, it's a really dense district. And so uh, it's unique in the sense that we're focused on social media. So me personally like yes you can donate money to the campaign but i'm trying to stay under two thousand dollars and that's i think revolutionary for our current campaign finance system i don't need more than that um but it, i mean you're more than welcome to but what i do need is likes and shares likes shares and follows and so feel free to follow the campaign because uh i i think uh this campaign is building a lot of traction because we're intersectional in all fronts I'm vegan, I'm Afro-Latinx, I'm non-binary, and I'm a worker. And so really what that means is I'm at the forefront of every single one of these struggles as their representative. And so um, like, follow, and share. Get the word out that there is pe there are people that are fighting against the machine at every level. And um, really that's the best thing people could do. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks for talking to me, Aiden. Um, I wish you luck in your candidacy. I really hope you get in. Um, I think uh, it's exciting that you're a young candidate. I think you have a great future ahead of you, and I think uh, you'll have a lot of success based on your um, your uh, disposition. Frankly, you know, you have a great attitude about it. So, uh, but uh, aside with, from all the other qualifications you have, thanks a lot. Thank you. Aiden. And, Thank you. Uh, we'll talk to you again later. Talk soon. Yeah, please. All right. Have a great day.